co-author of the New Mindset for IELTS course. Mm -hmm. She began teaching English in 2002 in the UK and Spain, where she prepared young learners for Cambridge English exams. She's been a tutor of English for academic purposes since 2008 and has taught on IELTS preparation courses in addition to preparing international students to start degree courses at Brunel University and King's College London. Lucy is currently based at King's College London, where she teaches on foundation programmes for international students, provides in-sessional support and in academic writing to current students and contributes to materials and course design. So with that, it's over to you, Lucy. OK, well, thank you very much, Jessica. Um, good morning, everyone, and thanks again for joining today's webinar. It's great to have so many people here um, from so many different countries around the world. It's all very exciting. Um, so I'm a contributing author uh, to the Mindset for IELTS series. Um, just to give you a very brief overview of this series, um, we have four different levels. Um, so our foundation level is for students who are just starting to think about um, taking the IELTS exam or preparing for it. And then levels one, two and three um, are designed for students aiming towards the following band scores uh, that you can see on the slide here. Um, in my webinar today, I'm going to be referring to some of the materials uh, from the Mindset series. Um, in particular, I'll be referring to materials from the Level 3 Student and Teacher's book. Um, but please do be assured that these exercises can be adapted for materials at any level um, and indeed for any IELTS materials as well. Um, so if you're not using this series at the moment, uh, then that's absolutely fine. Um, I'll also be referring to some of the online skills modules for Level 3. Um, these are additional online materials that can be accessed by students um, using a unique code that they can find in their copy of the student's book. Um, these modules are, are really useful um, for students to use for self-study, um, but they can also be used to facilitate a flipped classroom approach um, this is where students are given um, tasks to complete in their own time in advance of the class um, and then they're able to use the class time for perhaps more collaborative and evalu uh, evaluative uh, tasks. Um, I'm going to be giving an example a little bit later on in the webinar um, of how you can um, plan a flipped class uh, for a pronunciation class, so a little bit more uh, about that later on. Um, let's move on then uh, to the main content of the webinar. Um, so today I plan to cover the following areas. We're going to begin by considering why pronunciation may receive less attention than other IELTS speaking uh, skills um, in IELTS course books, on courses and so on. Um, as I mentioned in my, my blog, if you read that uh, before the webinar, um, pronunciation is worth 25% um, of a student's speaking score. So it is pretty important, and yet we seem to dedicate less time to it than we do to the other skills. So we're going to consider why this is. Next, we're going to move on to have a look at the band descriptors for the IELTS speaking test um, and just have a look at what they specifically say um, about pronunciation. After that, I'll be going through some key pronunciation features um, that are assessed in the IELTS speaking test. And then finally, I'll be giving you some tips for introducing IELTS pronunciation training uh, into your classes. Um, I'm hoping that it's not just going to be me talking throughout. Um, there will be some various points in the webinar where I'll kind of open uh, up the discussion to you and encourage you to um, write some of your ideas in the chat box and then we'll spend a little bit of time talking about these together uh, before I move on. So I'll let you know uh, when there's going to be an opportunity uh, to collaborate and uh, have a little bit of a chat about things. So for the first point then, why might pronunciation receive less attention um, than other speaking skills? Um, now, I'd like to um, turn the conversation over to you uh, at this point. Um, 
thinking about the IELTS speaking classes that you've taught, um, can you think of any possible reasons why we might spend less time on pronunciation in the classroom um, than other skills? Um, if, however, you're a tutor who spends quite a lot of time on pronunciation, um, that's obviously great to hear and you're, you're doing a brilliant job. Um, what kind of tasks um, do you do in your classroom um, to help students prepare specifically for pronunciation when they're preparing for the speaking test? So I'm going to give you a couple of minutes um, and have a look at um, some of your responses um, and then we'll compare some of our ideas together. OK, well, thank you very much for all of your contributions here um, some very interesting uh, points. Um, and I'd just like to cover a few of them um, as they're coming in. Um, so as for why perhaps we don't spend so much time on pronunciation uh, as we do on other skills. Um, one theme that I can see um, coming through your conversations here is perhaps it's perceived by both um, teachers and students as a bit less important than um, the others. Um, a lot of you have um, raised the point that intelligibility uh, is very important um, and as long as candidates are intelligible um, in the IELTS exam um, then um, that's fine. Um, if it's not um, impeding communication uh, then it's not going to be a big problem. So perhaps um, we think of it as being a bit less important. We we perhaps have faith um, that as long as our students are intelligible, uh, then they're going to manage pronunci pronunciation fine. Um, I think it's very important to be aware of this uh, and to not for students and tutors to not get too bogged down on uh, on how accent sounds. Uh, for example, uh, because it is very much intelligibility that's being tested uh, rather than being able to effectively mimic uh, a particular type of um, accent. Um, so that's very interesting. Um, there was a point that perhaps teachers might be unfamiliar uh, with some of the difficulties that students might face or they might not feel confident on how to address uh, these issues. Um, a couple of you have mentioned lack of time. Um, obviously, an IELTS course is, is quite sort of high pressure. Uh, there's a, a finite amount of time that we have to, to work on things. Um, so um, these are all very relevant points. Um, L1 interference, perhaps people have uh, difficulties uh, with this. Um, in terms of what you do to help your students, um, somebody has said that they encourage their students to speak in front of the mirror. Uh, I think that's a really good uh, technique to use um, always. So it's it's very good to hear that. 
Um, okay, excellent. Well, I, I think we've covered quite a lot of what I wanted to say here. Um, so I'll just go through some of my points quickly. Um, so the first issue, um, as uh, a number of you have mentioned, uh, maybe the time pressure involved uh, on IELTS prep courses. Um, often there simply isn't much time to focus on pronunciation in the classroom. Um, and as teachers, we may reasonably choose to focus on, say, fluency activities. Um, these might be more difficult for students to practice outside the classroom. Um, and in the same way, vocabulary development and grammatical range and accuracy uh, might be just considered more important because um, it's really important for our students to get our feedback uh, as tutors on this. Obviously, we can encourage them to practice speaking outside the class. Uh, but in order to get our feedback, uh, it really needs to be happening in the classroom. Um, so we may simply encourage our students to um, work on their pronunciation outside. Uh, we may, in any case, believe that pronunciation is best practiced outside uh, the classroom because the types of difficulties students may have uh, may be quite unique to them, um, depending on their L1 and their level of English. Uh, their level of speaking. Um, I think we also tend to have faith that those students who are having difficulties with pronunciation, um, and they're normally quite aware of that, um, will just put in the hours outside the classroom. Or perhaps if we have the luxury of being able to run one-to-one -one tutorials, um, we might save um, pronunciation for them to allow us to um, focus more uh, on individual students' um, difficulties. Um, so that could be another reason. Um, furthermore, when we do want to practice pronunciation in the classroom, we're quite likely to encourage peer evaluation. Um, and this is a really, really good thing to do, uh, both for practical reasons. Um, we simply don't have enough time in the classroom to go around uh, and spend any length of time with individual students on their pronunciation. Um, so it's a really good way of getting students to, um, to notice uh, one another. Um, but for pedagogic reasons as well, it's a really good way of raising students' awareness of how to do and how not to do something and to help them identify their own strengths and weaknesses. However, a lot of students just won't feel confident providing feedback for their peers and they might feel uncomfortable doing so. Um, I think this is particularly relevant to pronunciation as it's an area students often feel quite sensitive and self-conscious about. Um, so I think peer evaluation is really key, uh, but we have to be quite careful in how we're introducing it uh, and just making sure that our students feel comfortable doing this. And it might take a while to convince them. Indeed, it might not even be a question of how qualified um, students feel to comment on their fellow students' pronunciation. Um, they may strongly believe um, that it's the teacher who should be cor correcting their pronunciation, especially if they happen to have a native speaker of English as a teacher. And I'm going to say a bit more about this uh, in a little while. Um, they might even go as far as to say that a teacher who gets students to peer correct each other's pronunciation isn't doing their job properly by not correcting each error that each student makes. Um, so students are often going to need a bit of convincing that peer um, correction of pronunciation is a good idea. Um, I'd just like to make a point here about non-native uh, tutors. Uh, and I'd like to say that I strongly believe that non-native speakers of English can make excellent uh, teachers of pronunciation. Um, it's worth pointing out to your students that there are significant variations in pronunciation among native speakers of English anyway. Um, so you might have someone with an English accent, an Irish accent, American, South African, Nigerian, and all of these varieties are absolutely fine. Um, as we were discussing earlier, uh, it's intelligibility uh, that is really key in the IELTS speaking test. Um, and students will by no means be penalised uh, if they're using a perfectly acceptable variety of English, uh, which isn't uh, British English. 
Um, so that's a really important point to, to kind of hammer home to your students. Um, furthermore, um, non-native speakers of English might be more able to convince their students that you don't need to be a native speaker of English to be really knowledgeable about pronunciation features in English. Um, you can make the point that if a non-native teacher can learn and teach these features, then so can the non-native student and students can do this uh, for one another. So just to summarise then, um, these four factors may go some ways to explain why pronunciation receives less attention in the IELTS classroom um, than other speaking skills. However, it is really important um, to try to introduce some pronunciation into the classroom. And I think that students can really benefit from this, even if it does take a little bit more effort and it takes a bit of time to convince your students that it's a good idea. So having looked at these reasons, let's now actually take a look at the band descriptors uh, for IELTS speaking um, and see what these say about pronunciation. And it's always worth making sure your students are familiar with the band descriptors from the very beginning of their course. Uh, and when it comes to speaking, that they are familiar with what the uh, descriptors are saying specifically for uh, pronunciation. So the band descriptors for speaking are used to assess three main areas of pronunciation. Um, firstly, um, we have the range of pronunciation features uh, that the candidate uses. Um, so if we look at the descriptors, we'll see language like full range uses a full range of features uh, with precision and subtlety. That would be the band nine descriptor uh, for a candidate with, with very clear pronunciation. Um, uses a wide range of pronunciation features or uses a limited range. So range of features is going to be very key here. And that's obviously something that we want to try to teach our students in the classroom. Next, we have the level of control that a candidate exercises over these features. Um, so here we have language such as flexibility or prone to lapses. Um, we can see for band nine, uh, this candidate sustains flexible use of features throughout. Um, and uh, we might see prone to lapses in some of the lower, um, some of the lower band descriptors. Um, thirdly, uh, we have the candidate's level of intelligibility. Um, so in the highest band score, um, this candidate would be effortless uh, to understand. Uh, and in the lowest, when we go down to band score two, uh, we see speech is often unintelligible. Um, so these three areas um, are the areas that are assessed uh, in the IELTS exam. Um, and it's therefore really important that students are familiar with the pronunciation features uh, that are assessed in the speaking test and that they're given lots of opportunity to practice these and receive feedback in the classroom. Um, of course, we want students to continue to practice their pronunciation outside the classroom. This is really important as well. Um, but if they're given the opportunities to practice in the classroom, uh, they're likely to get more familiar with uh, the features uh, and this is going to make them a lot more confident. So let's now move on uh, to look at the pronunciation features that are assessed in the IELTS speaking test. Um, so looking at the descriptors, uh, we've seen statements such as uses a full range of features. Um, but which features are the descriptors talking about? Um, now here, I'd like to open the discussion up to you again in the chat box. Um, so what features of English pronunciation do your students find challenging? Um, I'd like you to have a little think about this and put some of your ideas in the chat box because this will help us to explore some of these features and to predict what some of these are. So what features of English pronunciation do your students find challenging? 
I'm going to give you a few minutes to type your ideas in the box and then we'll discuss some of them together. Intonation, vowel sounds, connected speech, sentence stress. So I'm seeing quite a lot of themes emerging here. No emotion when speaking. They say it as a robot. I like that. That's something we're going to cover a little bit later on. Okay, well, thank you very much for your contributions here. Um, do keep them coming. Um, this is really good. Uh, and it's good to see that uh, one person types something in uh, and other people are saying, yes, I've noticed that as well. Uh, so we definitely have some, uh, some clear themes emerging here. And um, so if we're thinking about the features that are assessed in the IELTS speaking test, um, they fall into six main areas, and I'm just going to go through these now. Um, through our discussion in the chat box, I think pretty much all of these areas have been covered, which is brilliant. Um, so we'll just have a look at them together. Um, these are quite wide areas, and a lot of what you're saying is going to fit into some of them in a more specific way. Um, so hopefully we'll have a bit of time at the end uh, to discuss more specific examples of some of these features. So the first feature that we could look at is accuracy. Um, so this is going to concern anything related to individual sounds of English. Um, I've noticed um, that a lot of you in the chat box have typed in particular sounds that your students find challenging. And this is obviously going to vary depending on their L1, um, how long they've been speaking English for, uh, and so on. Um, Another accuracy issue could be the use of correct word stress. So are students um, stressing the correct syllable uh, in a word? Um, as a lot of you have mentioned here, um, speakers of other languages might find it difficult to produce some of these individual sounds, um, depending on their L1. Um, this could be due to L1 interference. Um, it could be that um, there's a, they're using the sound that they would use in their language rather than the sounds that would be used in English. Or it might simply be that this sound doesn't exist in their L1, which makes it extra challenging. Um, so accuracy is certainly um, an area that it would be worthwhile working on uh, in the classroom. Um, our next feature is word stress. Um, so this would be the emphasis placed on a particular syllable uh, in a word. Um, English is a stress time language, which means that stressed syllables occur at regular intervals among weaker syllables. Um, so if we take the word computer, for example, it's a word with three syllables and it has its emphasis or stress on the second syllable. So we don't say computer or computer, we say computer. Um, if a student places stress on the incorrect syllable in a word, uh, and this is quite a common uh, inaccuracy, particularly for words, perhaps longer words with more syllables or less familiar words, um, this is something that might infect, uh, affect their intelligibility, particularly if it's occurring quite frequently. So in addition to word stress, we have um, sentence stress. 
Um, this is where the emphasis is placed on a particular word in a sentence. Um, and it's a little bit different from word stress because we use this to convey meaning. Um, we can see an example of this below. So we've got the same sentence, but with different stress on a different word. Um, if we say she called you yesterday, um, we're emphasizing uh, that she called you and not somebody else. Whereas if we say she called you yesterday, uh, we're emphasizing that the day was yesterday and not another day. Um, so this is quite important for uh, conveying the meaning of what we're saying. And um, next we have weak sounds. Um, so this is where the schwa, um, this is the sort of upside down E in the uh, phonetic al alphabet, um, as in the final syllable of computer comes in. Um, this is a common sound in English. Um, I would like to stress at this point that um, the schwa is more common in some varieties of English than other. So it's particularly noticeable in British English. It might be a bit less prominent in American English, uh, for example. Uh, and I do want to just reiterate um, that candidates in the IELTS speaking test will not be penalised for using a particular variety of English that is not British English. Um, so if um, a candidate has been taught using American English, uh, that is absolutely fine. We still find this weak schwa sound in American English. It's just a little bit less prominent. So it's still worth um, teaching. It's very much worth teaching this weak sound and making students aware of it. And being able to produce this sound will make a candidate spoken English sound more natural. So it's definitely worthwhile to do. But just do be aware that it is more common in British English than it might be in other varieties. And um, next we have um, linking sounds. Um, so these are the sounds that come between individual words, uh, which are used to create a smooth and natural sounding flow uh, of information. Um, these come in slightly different varieties. Um, so we might have vowel to consonant linking. Notice it says linking words here. Here we're not talking about words that are used to link ideas, uh, but the way in which words link together. So if we have a vowel to consonant, consonant link, um, we can hear the two words sort of blending together. Um, let's take this phrase switch off as an example. So if we look at these two words individually, switch off, um, we don't really see or we can't hear a link between them. If we put them into a sentence, um, so if we say, can you switch off the computer before you leave? We notice they kind of blend together and switch off almost becomes one word on its own. Um, can you switch off the computer? We also have vowel to vowel sounds. We sometimes call these intrusive sounds because they're introducing new sounds uh, that are produced between the words. Again, if we look at individual words, we wouldn't notice these sounds uh, and we wouldn't be immediately aware of them. Let's look at the, look at the phrase, to be honest. If we take these words individually, to be honest, uh, we don't really notice any sounds in between them. But of course, this isn't how we would say this phrase. Um, if we say it in a natural way, they would link together, uh, to be honest. And can you notice between be and honest, we produce a y sound, be honest, to be honest. So if we introduce students to sounds like this, they have the, the opportunity to sound more natural and for their language to, to flow. And as some of you mentioned a little bit earlier, to not sound monotonous or robotic. Next, we have intonation. Now, this is something that a lot of you brought up in the chat box. So it, this will be worth spending a little bit of time on. So intonation is the rise and fall of our voices as we speak. And um, it is worth pointing out that intonation can be quite difficult to teach. 
um, as it varies very subtly and frequently, depending on the context of what we're saying. Um, there's no real sort of right or wrong intonation, which makes it quite difficult to stu for students to get the hang of. However, if we ignore intonation completely, some of our students might risk sounding monotone, uh, which IELTS examiners tend not to like very much. A monotone voice in a speaking test can also indicate that a candidate is reciting something that they've memorised, which might lose the marks uh, for pronunciation. So intonation is definitely worth spending a little bit of time on. Um, Students might be a little bit resistant to learning about intonation at first, simply because there doesn't seem to be any rules. In the same way, teachers might not feel very confident in teaching it, uh, because it might just seem a little bit too open. If this is the case, you might want to introduce some general rules. Um, I do hesitate to describe these as rules, because they're not absolute in the same way uh, that something like word stress might be. But if we introduce very general rules, it might help students to get the hang of intonation. So one possible general rule that we can look at is when intonation rises and when it falls. For example, if we take statements, um, these typically use falling intonation. So if we look at the statement below, I don't worry too much about my diet at the moment. You can hear, or you hopefully heard from that example, that my intonation was falling slightly, because this is a statement. So this is one general rule that we could teach our students. Another one concerns lists. Um, so if we're listing a number of items, we tend to use rising intonation until we get to the final item on our list. And then uh, we move to falling intonation to indicate that this is uh, the final item. Um, if we have a look and a listen uh, to the example below, if I had to choose, I'd say that I most like to sink into the sofa, put my feet up and lose myself in a good movie. Notice here, lose myself in a good movie was the final item on the list. So we might use falling intonation to indicate that we're not going to mention any more points here. Um, we also have the type of intonation that we might use with questions. So yes, no questions typically have rising in intonation. For example, do you follow a healthy diet? And WH word questions typically have falling information. What do you mean by healthy? Again, these are not absolute hard and fast rules, but they might help students to start to understand uh, the variation in intonation um, that uh, we have in English. So these are our six features, the main six features that are assessed in the IELTS speaking test. And it's therefore likely to be really useful to focus on these features and make sure that students are aware of them from the very, very beginning uh, of their IELTS preparation course. And it might be useful to put together some kind of resource, maybe a little checklist um, for um, making students aware of these fe features, particularly if they're doing some kind of peer uh, activity uh, which involves peer correction. So having had a look at the features, we're going to move on now to look at some practical activities that you can use in the classroom uh, for helping students to improve their pronunciation for IELTS. I'd like to introduce another little interactive stage here. Um, I'd like you to think about the types of activity you do in the classroom to work on pronunciation with your students. This could be very specifically for IELTS pronunciation, but you should also think about the types of activity you'd use in perhaps a general English class, because any type of pronunciation activity is likely to be very transferable to the IELTS context. So I'm going to give you just a couple of minutes to discuss this and type your ideas in the chat box, and then we'll look at some of them together. So what types of activity do you do in the classroom to practice pronunciation? 
with your students. Okay, this is great. We've got a really good range of tasks here. Uh, it's really interesting to see um, the range of pronunciation tasks that you're using in the classroom. Uh, this is really, really good. Um, so just to take uh, a couple of these, uh, drama and role play. I think that could be really nice for lightening the mood. Um, students may get a little bit bogged down in um, IELTS preparation classes. So if you can bring in something that's going to be quite good fun, that's going to give them a little bit of a, a break, but is still going to be very relevant to improving their pronunciation, uh, that's great. Uh, particularly if you can emphasize to your students that um, a lot of the features they're going to be using by bringing this drama in um, are going to be very positive features in the IELTS speaking test, such as word stress, rising intonation and so on. Um, listening and drilling I think is also very very useful. Um, marking up scripts using transcripts, this is something I'm going to talk about a little bit later. I think that's really useful for working on specific features um, of uh, pronunciation that are assessed. Um, doing a lot of pair work and monitoring very closely. This is really important, um, particularly if we take into account the, uh, the time pressures that are involved and just getting students really uh, comfortable with working together. Um, getting students to give talks. I think this could be really good practice for part two of the speaking test uh, where students are, are giving a a short monologue on a particular topic uh, and it would be really um, useful for um, uh, or really helpful for showing the relevance of doing this saying this is going to be really similar to what you have to do uh, in part two uh, of the IELTS test. Um, so this all looks really good um, so I'm going to move on to a few of these um, tips now uh, but do keep your ideas coming uh, because this is really great and it's really good to, to share best practice on a platform like this. So one really useful um, tool that we can use or one really nice resource that we typically have quite wide access to when we're teaching IELTS is to use model answers um, uh, given by candidates doing the IELTS speaking test to specifically practice pronunciation. Um, you can find these model answers in lots of different places. So they might be in um, the student's course book. Um, they might actually be in the teacher's book. They might be in a recorded format. Um, and of course, you've got the transcripts. Um, so students can use these answers to identify specific features of pronunciation that are assessed in the IELTS speaking test. Um, you could do this through getting them to listen to the model answer if you've got a recorded version of it um, or you could get them to mark up a transcript or indeed you could do both. So I'm going to show you a quick um, example of this now. Um, these examples are taken from Mindset for IELTS from the Level 3 uh, teacher's book. Uh, so this is a transcript that was featured there. And um, here, the students have been asked to mark up uh, the stress. Um, so the examiner says, how often do you eat healthy meals? Um, the candidate says, well, it depends what you mean by healthy. But I try to keep my intake of junk food down to a minimum. 
And most days I make sure I have at least some fruit and vegetables, even if it's not as much as I should. Also, because I'm young and in relatively good shape, I don't worry about my diet too much at the moment, to be honest. So we can see here in this example, um, the emphasis is very much on stress. So if you wanted to do a lesson on this particular pronunciation feature, getting students to mark it up, compare their ideas, and then practice saying it could be a really useful thing to do. Um, and you can tell your students to really kind of ham it up and go to town. They can really over-exaggerate the stressed words. Say to them that obviously they wouldn't do this in uh, the IELTS speaking test, but it's a good way of drawing awareness of which words are stressed. It can make it quite fun and light-hearted as well and take a little bit of the pressure off. Um, so this could be a really useful activity to do, particularly if your students are sounding, as some of you were mentioning before, a little bit monotone. Um, this is going to bring a little bit of variation uh, into their speech. Um, another marking up activity could be to get students to mark up weak sounds, the schwa sounds. Um, so here we've got another example from uh, the Mindset for IELTS Level 3 Teachers book. So the examiner says, how do you like to relax? The candidate says, if I had to choose, I'd say that I most like to sink into the sofa, put my feet up and lose myself in a good movie. The thing is, I've got a lot of pressure on at the moment, as, in my, as I'm in my final year of study. So I really need time to switch off. Watching a film helps me to forget that pressure for a while. So we can see here lots of examples of where we might have this weak schwa sound. Um, and I will just reiterate that, I mean, obviously I have a British accent and the British accent uses the schwa sound quite frequently. It might not be used quite so frequently in other varieties such as American English. So it really is up to you as the teacher to decide how, um, in, like how prominent the schwa sound is going to be. It might be that you choose not to mark up quite as many as I have here. But regardless of the variety of English, these little words that we have in between, such as to, if I, we wouldn't say if I had to choose, we'd say if I had to choose. So it's going to be relevant in lots of different varieties of English. And this could be a really good way of drawing students' attention to this schwa sound and getting them to practice. Again, get them to practice just saying the sound and you can make it quite light-hearted. Get them to do lots of uh. Um, when would you make this uh sound? Maybe when you're feeling annoyed or frustrated with something. So really drawing their attention to that sound and then hopefully they'll remember it and remember when to use it. So marking up can be a really useful activity. It will allow you to spend a little bit of time on pronunciation so it's not being rushed through. Um, these are really just two examples of features that um, could be marked up. You could equally get students to mark up rising and falling intonation and perhaps experiment with uh, the types of intonation that you would use. And this would really help to familiarise students with intonation. OK, next, um, and I think a couple of you have mentioned this, getting students to record them spe some, themselves speaking is a really useful exercise. Um, it's a very effective way of encouraging peer assessment as well. Um, obviously, students might record themselves speaking outside the class, and that's a really useful activity. But it's a really useful thing to bring into the classroom as well. Um, Tutors who are using the Mindset for IELTS series um, could direct them to the online skills modules um, where students can listen to an examiner asking questions and then record their responses. Um, this is a really great resource anyway because it gives students the chance to practice IELTS um, speaking part one, two and three without actually being in the classroom. Um, but this could be really effectively delivered as a flipped lesson. So we might get students to do the recording of the responses outside the class um, and then bring them into the class and peer assess one another. Um, I'll just quickly show you um, on the next slide what this looks like. So if students log on 
um, to the online speaking module. Um, this is the final exercise in the Unit 8 module. So students are told they're going to do an IELTS speaking part three. They're going to listen to the examiner asking questions, record their answers, and then select finish when they're done. Um, students can download these answers and save them to their computer, which means that they can then bring them into the classroom uh, and use them for uh, peer assessment. A third uh, exercise uh, that we could get students to do um, is to introduce them to speech recognition software. Um, now, this is obviously not specifically designed for practicing pronunciation, um, but by lucky coincidence, it can be a really effective way uh, of getting students to analyse one another's pronunciation and any difficulties that they might have with it. Um, so speech recognition software such as speech notes is um, it's designed um, for people to make notes uh, in a verbal form uh, and it might also be used for transcribing as well um, but it's really really useful for looking at features of pronunciation um, so speech notes works by providing students with a platform um, where they're given a microphone uh, that they can speak into, rather like I'm doing now, actually. Um, but their speech will be transcribed in real time. Um, and we're going to show you an example um, of how uh, this can work uh, in just a minute. How do you like to relax? Question mark. If I had to choose, I'd say I most like to sink into the sofa, put my feet up and lose myself in a good movie. Full stop. The thing is, I've got a lot of pressure on at the moment as I'm in my final year of study, so I really need time to switch off. Full stop. Watching a film helps me to forget that pressure for a while. Full stop. Okay, so that was uh, an example that I put together myself um, of how it could work. Um, obviously, um, because I'm speaking quite slowly uh, and in my accent, we can't see any uh, pronunciation issues here. Um, but if students were doing this and there was perhaps a feature of pronunciation that they didn't have quite right yet, uh, whether that's the pronunciation of an individual sound or whether there's an issue with their linking between words, this kind of thing would show up in the transcription. Um, students would then be able to look at one another's transcriptions and do some peer assessment uh, on that. Um, and this could be a really useful way uh, of getting students to, uh, to notice uh, any um, difficulties that they have and then try it again. Um, this can obviously be used really nicely as a self-study tool for outside the classroom as well. So students can work individually on their pronunciation, perhaps reading out uh, a little segment from a, a part uh, to um, speaking test that they've prepared, uh, and then they can record themselves again uh, where they try to correct the error uh, that they've made. Um, but I think it's really useful to bring this uh, into the um, classroom as well. Um, someone's mentioned here it would be great to use something like speech notes on phones. Um, I must be honest, I'm not sure whether it's possible to, to use it on a phone, but I will look into that uh, because I agree that would be a, a really useful resource as students would, uh, would have it there uh, in the classroom with them. Uh, I think this may actually be possible, and if it isn't now, then hopefully uh, it will be in the future as, as more and more people are using uh, their phones for a variety of, of different tasks. Uh, but I agree that would be uh, really useful. So um, these are just a few activities uh, that you could use to practice pronunciation for IELTS in your classroom, and they'll give you the opportunity to really focus on pronunciation 
rather than uh, the other skills. The other skills are still important, of course, but this is just making sure uh, pronunciation uh, gets um, gets a bit of a, a look in here. And um, one point that um, a few of you have asked about the speech notes is, is it free? Um, so I just want to quickly say um, something about that. Um, the very basic version of it is free. Um, the, the version that I have is, um, it's a slightly more advanced version. Um, I paid about six pounds for it, uh, but it's a one-off payment. It's not something that you have to pay for monthly. And um, once you've got it, you can use it all the time. Um, and of course, it has uses beyond uh, working on IELTS pronunciation. Students might find it useful for, uh, for other things as well. Um, so in answer for that question, it is free, but only the basic version. It probably would be worth um, downloading the uh, version that you have to do a one-off payment for. Um, but I think students will still find the basic free uh, version useful. OK, then. Um, so I would like to stress at this point, I've been talking mainly uh, about how we can bring IELTS pronunciation into the classroom. Um, but um, I do want to stress that it's still really important for students to continue to practice pronunciation outside the classroom because they do really need that uh, consolidation opportunity. Um, and a lot of these activities will involve maybe doing something, preparing something outside the classroom and then bring it, bringing it into the class uh, for uh, more of a sort of collaborative peer evaluation uh, type task. However, I think the opportunity to bring pronunciation practice into the classroom and to train students to critically evaluate their own and others' pronunciation even if this might be difficult at first and students might take a bit of convincing, it really is an opportunity not to be missed. I think students can learn a great deal from one another uh, and just by getting that chance to do the practice in the classroom, uh, they'll be building their, their awareness of the features uh, of pronunciation that are assessed in the IELTS exam, um, becoming more flexible, becoming more intelligible, and these are the criteria uh, in the descriptors that could really help students to increase their band score uh, for IELTS speaking. Okay, so that pretty much brings us to the end of the webinar. Um, I'd just like you to show. I'd just like to show you my list of references here. Um, the um, information that I gave on the six features of the pronunciation. Uh, come from IELTS Canada and um, they have some very nice resources there uh, for looking at these features and I think these could be great resources both for students and teachers um, so do have a look at those um, a little bit later on uh, in your own time uh, but that just leaves us to answer some questions um, so I'm going to hand you back to Jessica now but I'd just like to say Thank you very much for listening and thank you for all of your contributions to the chat box as well. It looks like we've had a really, really good, really useful sort of parallel conversation uh, among teachers going uh, going on. Uh, and that that's really great. That's exactly what we want to see. So thank you very much for your contributions. Uh, and I will now take some questions. Thank you, Lucy. Thank that you. really was a, a great session and thanks to all of you who've joined us and you've been so engaged it's been great to see your ideas so we've we've got a couple of minutes to take questions um lucy um mohammed had a couple of questions um during the session and i'd mm -hmm. um like to ask you um one of his questions in particular um mm -hmm. he says we often need to strike a balance between fluency and accuracy activities um mm. do you think age needs to be considered while preparing students for IELTS? Um, sorry, do you think um, age. age? So is that age of the students? Yes, so if we've got a group of, say, younger learners who perhaps are um, have less uh, world experience or older students who might be more set in their ways, they've learnt the incorrect ways of, of um, saying words. OK, well, that, that's a very, very interesting question. Thank you very much uh, for that, Mohammed. Um, I think 
ideally, um, the way in which we teach pronunciation would be quite different um, for older uh, and, and younger students. Um, but of course, we need to bear in mind that we may well have not only a mix of nationality uh, in our classes, uh, but also a mix of ages. Um, I think being aware of how receptive our students might be to working on pronunciation uh, is, is definitely important. Um, so as, as Mohammed says, or as you say, Mohammed, certainly older learners might be a bit more uh, fixed in their ways when it comes to pronunciation. Um, it's also but worth bearing in mind that it's actually more difficult for older learners to improve their pronunciation than it might be for younger learners. Um, because it, it's one of those features of acquisition that it's just much easier for us to acquire when we're learning a second language when we're younger uh, than when we're older. Uh, so that's something we would definitely want to be aware of. Um, I think we need to work within the bounds of what is possible for uh, a student as well. So if, for example, we have an older student who has a real difficulty with a sound and they just don't seem to be able to move beyond that difficulty, I think if it's a sound that's not affecting their intelligibility too much, um, we, we would certainly make them aware of it. Um, but if it's just going to be too difficult for them to make that change and they're still perfectly intelligible, I think we maybe wouldn't worry about it so much um, as long as there are other features of intelligibility there, which are still going to help them to get the best band score uh, that we can. Um, I think with younger learners, um, we might have some slightly different um, issues. Um, younger learners might find it um, easier to, uh, to improve their pronunciation. So if there's a particular sound they're having difficulty with, I think they might find it easier to make those changes. Um, one issue that younger students might have, um, which older students might not have, is they might actually feel a little bit more self-conscious, particularly if they're teenagers. Um, older students might be a little bit more open to maybe doing things like drilling. Um, uh, they might have um, fewer inhibitions than younger students. But this is very much a generalisation. You might have more self-conscious older students uh, and you might have younger students who are perfectly happy to do a bit of drilling and jazz chants and, and, and to really have fun with it. Um, just to summarise, though, I think striking a balance uh, is, is very important. And um, we certainly don't want students to get really kind of preoccupied with the accuracy of their pronunciation, because it really is intelligibility uh, that is going to be the deciding factor uh, for, their, um, for their mark for pronunciation. Uh, if they can't be understood, then that's really going to... Uh, affect their mark. Whereas if they're making the odd um, sound inaccuracy here and there, uh, it's not going to, uh, to have such an effect on their score. And um, does that sound okay? Yes, thank you, Lucy. Thank you for that um, um, great answer. And just, we've, we've got about a minute left, but I just wanted to, um, something that came up about um, accents and pronunciation and um, you know, the British versus the American accent. And Lucy, your thoughts on that? OK, well, one thing I really, really want to stress is that um, accent is not something that is going to be assessed uh, for pronunciation in the IELTS um, speaking test. Um, it really is all about correct pronunciation and intelligibility. Um, when it comes to, say, the difference between British English and American English, um, they're, from the point of view of the speaking test, one really is not better than the other, uh, and they would both be um, treated equally. Um, so if students have been practising American pronunciation, uh, they are not going to be penalised for using a, an American variety rather than a British uh, variety uh, of, of speaking. Um, so those, act and indeed, you might have um, other um, other English accents which have been used, and, and they are absolutely fine as well. 
Um, so I just want to reassure everyone um, that um, accent is really not assessed in the IELTS exam. It's, it's accuracy, it's intelligibility, and it's the range of features uh, that are being used. And if those features are slightly different in American English than they are in British English, and the example I used earlier was maybe the schwa, the weak uh sound, is a bit less prominent in uh, American English than it is in British. That's not something that a candidate would be in any way penalised for. Okay, great. Thank you, Lucy. Um, I'm afraid we're now at the end of our session. Um, so we have got the um, download the certificate on screen. So hopefully you've all been able to download. Um, it's been such a fantastic session. I want to say a big thank you to Lucy. Um, that was your second um, webinar for us. And we hope there'll be a lot more with you in future. And a reminder for everyone that we've recorded this session and it will be um, available on the YouTube channel later next week and you, you should receive an email with a link to the recording. So if you've missed anything or if you wanted to review anything, you'll be able to do that. Um, also on screen now, you should be able to see details of our next uh, webinar for IELTS teachers. So please don't forget to join us on Thursday, the 11th of April, where Greg Archer will be talking about the um, writing test and what examiners are looking for. So thank you again, Lucy. Thank you very much. Thanks, everyone, for coming. And we'll see you all soon. Thank you. Bye. Bye.